All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Sober Yoga Girl. I am really excited to have Claire Pooley sitting with me here today. And Claire Pooley is the author of The Sober Diaries, which is one of the Quitlet books that I think I read probably in my first maybe 100 days sober. And we actually used it as a Sober Girls Yoga book club book probably at some point in 2020. So a lot of my community members have definitely read it. So it's just really, really exciting to have you here. So welcome, Claire, and thanks for joining. Oh, thank you for asking me. I'm so delighted to be here. So yeah, hi. How are you doing? (laughs) I'm good, thank you. Yes, it's January right now. um, And I love January because it's that time of year where you feel really fashionable. (laughs) You feel like everybody is doing the same thing that you do all the time. So, So yeah, hooray for January. You're right. It is an exciting time. Actually, there's so much momentum and so many people exploring sober curiosity and Yeah, it's a good month. So I was wondering if we could start off by you just giving a little bit of context into sort of who you are, where you're based. Um, You can tell us a little bit about your books. Okay. Um, Yeah. So I live in London and I have been sober now for nearly seven years, which I I still find extraordinary. I, you know, I remember so vividly the days when I used to count every single day, in fact, every single hour almost. And these days I forget how many years it's been and I have to think, hang on, is it six or is it seven? And that that seems really extraordinary to me given, you know, where I started. But yes, I've been sober for nearly seven years and um, I quit drinking when I guess there was no major sort of revelation. My drinking just crept up on me so gradually I hardly noticed it was happening and over the decades I just started drinking gradually more and more and more until it got to the stage where I was drinking a bottle of wine every day and probably two at weekends so about 10 bottles of wine a week which is a huge amount and by this stage I had three small kids um, and you know my life from the outside looked like it was all you know, all fine and all going well. But the reality was it was sort of falling apart at the seams, really. And, you know, I was a terrible insomniac. I was overweight. I was stuck in a rut. I was uh, I was sort of just a bit generally miserable about life. And I didn't like myself. I didn't really like myself at all. So that's when I quit. And yeah, I mean, my my life is so totally different now. I wouldn't know where to start yeah. <laughs> to describe it. Wow. Well, congratulations on seven years. That's incredible. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone who's at the beginning, it does get easier. <laughs> you know, the the first yeah. hundred days are are the hardest. Um, but uh, you know, but it gets easier and easier and it gets the stage, you know, where I am now, I I hardly ever think about drinking unless I'm talking about it like I am with you or you know, on social media or whatever. You know, I hardly ever think about it. And I never believed I could be the sort of person that didn't think about drinking I used to think about drinking all the time that was part of the problem it was always on my mind and now it just doesn't really I don't notice when other people are drinking I don't worry about what anyone else is doing it it just doesn't really feature in my life anymore wow that's so amazing and you're right like I think most people would relate to that having gone through a a sober journey of like you know, when I was first quitting, I don't think I could ever imagine not thinking about it. Right. And then you just hit a point where it just becomes your, your new normal, which is incredible. Yeah, But it it does take a long time. And I think, uh, you know, people who do dry January, for instance, you know, what I think they don't realize is that that, that first month is the hardest bit, but the real benefits don't really kick in till at least a hundred days. Yes. So, you know, if you're just doing a month, you're getting all the tough bits without all the really good bits. And the good bits do come, but it takes a long time to sort of retrain your subconscious. So don't despair if you're in the early days and you're thinking, you know, is my life always going to be this difficult? Because it really won't be. But just give it time. It's so true. Yeah. And so tell me about, so during your sober journey, you, the whole book began by just keeping a blog, right? Mummy was a secret drinker. So maybe you can tell us a bit about like how that started. Yeah. I mean, when I quit, I think things have changed a bit recently. I think it's easier to be sober now than it mm-hmm. was seven years ago. Uh, but 
back then, um, you know, if you quit drinking, if you quit smoking, people sort of patted you on the back and told you you were brilliant and had great willpower and all that sort of stuff. But if you quit drinking, they thought you were a bit strange. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and their automatic reaction was, oh, do you have a problem? Oh, you poor thing. And, you know, and they want to talk about it and, um, you know, and quiz you about, about exactly sort of, you know, why you have to quit and how awful it must have been and all these sorts of things. And I just couldn't face doing all of that. I couldn't, I felt like I was the only person in the world who was going through what I was going through. And I felt really ashamed of where I'd ended up. And, and I didn't, and I was too ashamed to go to AA. I didn't have the courage to go to AA. Um, and, and I just didn't think it was, yeah, just, I, I didn't think it would be, there would be anyone at AA who was like me and, which was, you know, pro- pro- probably wrong, but that's the way I felt at the time. And so, but I knew I sort of had to talk to somebody. I had to get it all off my chest. I had to have some sort of sort of therapy. So I thought, well, actually, if I start writing, which was my, what I used to do when I was a teenager, I used to write a diary and I found it really therapeutic. And I thought, well, I could do that again. You know, I could write a sort of diary and write about everything I'm feeling and everything I'm going through. And that might be really helpful. But I thought, well, look, you know, this is, what was it then, 2015, and nobody writes diaries anymore. They write blogs. That was the sort of, you know, the, the, the new thing back then. So, uh, so I thought I'd write a blog. And and also, I think I'd probably been watching too much Sex in the City, and I sort of saw myself as Carrie Bradshaw, you know, <laughs> sitting there late at night in, with her laptop, and I thought, I can do that. So... So I started this anonymous blog and I called it Mummy Was a Secret Drinker and I called myself Sober Mummy and I didn't want anyone to know it was me. So um, so I didn't publicize it at all, but it sort of went viral. And I think because actually the reality was there were so many people like right. me who were also feeling alone and right. they were also feeling ashamed and they were also Googling, am I an alcoholic? And, you know, Google led them to my blog and... Through that blog, I you know the, we, I found this huge community of of people, and they really helped me, and I helped them back. And it was you know community is the most powerful thing in 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 early sobriety, actually in in any at any time in, in sobriety. That blog eventually became um, the book, the Sober Diaries, wow. um, when I eventually came out under my own name, <laughs> which was a bit scary. <laughs> And uh, and published it. So uh, so yeah. So that's that's how it all started. That is so incredible. And tell me about like what was that transition like from moving from the blog to the book? Like, did you was it something that you kind of came to on your own? Did your family know that the that you were writing the blog, or like how did that come about? Well. I didn't tell anyone to start off with about the blog, but my husband eventually discovered what I was up to. I think because he probably thought I was having an affair or something because I was typing away and then closing the lid of the laptop. So, so I think he eventually discovered what I was doing and he, I think it was really helpful for him also reading my blog because it helped him to understand what I was going through without us having one of those awkward conversations that it's really difficult to do even when you've been married to somebody for a long time so that's how he found out about it and but you know nobody else knew what I was doing until it must have been at least I mean I've been writing for at least a year when um, finally one of the the mothers on the school run managed to put two and two together and worked out that the blog she'd been reading secretly was me and um, and that was quite freaky (laughs) and and at that point I was getting more and more people sort of sending me messages saying you know why don't you publish this as a book because it would reach more people and I knew if I was going to do that I had to do it under my own name so, so that's the point at which I thought, okay, you know, it's been a year. I'm, I, I need to wow. sort of stop hiding under this pseudonym. But, but it was, you know, that was quite frightening. Um, but you know, I mean, I, 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 I can't believe now that I was so worried about it. And, you know, because actually, when you make yourself vulnerable, when you tell people the truth about what you're really going through, people are generally kind, you know, people are unkind if they think you're not being true or honest or authentic. But 
you know, generally, if if they know you are, if they know that that you're being really upfront about the issues you've had, people are generally really understanding and really kind. Yeah. Claire and I met when I actually attended a book club that Claire was a guest at, at Be Sober. And something that I remember you mentioning was just how your family, like how your husband supported you when you were deciding to publish the book. I can't remember what you, what he said, but I remember writing it down and being like, wow, that's beautiful. But can you remind me again, like how was, how did that go when you said to him that you were going to publish the story? Yeah, I mean, I couldn't have done it without my family's backing because yeah. because they're in it, you know, it's their life as well as my life. And my husband's a really private person. So, you know, I, I thought that there was absolutely no way that he would want me washing our dirty laundry in public, <laughs> so to speak. So uh so we were on holiday and um and I waited till the right moment and I plucked up the courage and I said, look, you know, I've been thinking about doing something and I wanted to talk it through with you. And it's probably a really stupid idea, but, you know, sort of let me know what you think. And and I said, you know, my blog, um, which he was really supportive about. He loved the fact that I, I was writing and that uh, that this, you know, that I was helping people and that those people were helping me. He loved yeah. all of that. And and I said, look, more and more people keep saying, why don't you publish this as a book? And it probably probably nobody would want to publish it, but I was thinking about giving it a go. And and but you know, it would it might be awful and people might hate me and and you know it might be embarrassing for you and the kids, and you might want me to do it, and I completely understand. And and he said, look, he said, yeah, there might be some downsides and there might be some upsides, and it would be it a real adventure and don't we all need more adventure in our lives and that was why I published it because he was just such a star and it's true we do all need more adventure in our lives and you know you don't get you don't get the exciting bits of life without taking risks um so and I I think that's something that I didn't do for you know decades when I was drinking is is take any risks you know I got you know, I, I was so used to numbing all my emotions with alcohol, you know, any anxiety, any fear, any boredom, you know, any any negative emotions. And and when you do that, you you lose your courage um, and you lose your self-respect and you lose you lose um, the ability to believe you can do things. So, yeah, that's that's how it all happened. Well, can I just say, like, I admire your courage and bravery so much. Like, I think it's a huge thing to put yourself out there and in a way that is like permanently there, you know, like that book is permanently out there and, and to, to share your story and be so vulnerable. Like it just, it takes huge courage. Well, look at you though. You've changed your whole life too. You know, you've moved to the other side of the world. You set up your own business, you change careers, you know, you're putting yourself out there, Aww. you know, it's, you know, there's. I think there's something about the process of getting sober that um, that that you know really changes people fundamentally, and it changes yeah. the course of their lives in ways that that they you know they ha- they don't expect at all. You know, I I thought my life was going to be over, and in fact, it just marked a whole new you know whole new part of my life, a whole new act, if you like. And uh, and that happens to so many people. I've talked to so many people who've had new careers, new relationships, new hobbies, new passions. Yeah, no, it's it's, it's kind of you to say, but I, I'm honestly not the only one. There, are, <laughs> there yeah. are thousands of people out there who had the same experience. So true. It's like a. It's like almost like you're like I've heard it described as like peeling back layers of the onion and like really finding out like who you really are. Yeah, I mean, I, I I found that the first year was very much like that. It's all about sort of that self analysis and that really painful peeling back of the layers, and uh, and you sort of you sort of have to take yourself apart before you can put yourself back together again, and and it's a really intense and painful process. Um, but then the second year, 
um, of being sober is is very much about looking outwards again and thinking, okay, now what? Now what do I do? I've got more time. I've got more energy. I've got more space in my head. I've got more more focus and more understanding and more wisdom. And and what am I going to do with all of that? And and that's that's often when your life sort of pivots. And um, is that what you found? Mm-hmm. Is it? Uh, because um, I think people assume that when you quit drinking, the whole, you know, the whole process of getting sober is is sort of what, a few months and then, you know, but it's not, it goes on and on, you know, and, and you go through new stages. And, and year two, I think, is as transformational as year one. It's just a lot easier. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It made me think of actually, um, I'm sure you had this question as well, because I know you were on the, the sober experiment with Alex and Lisa. I was a guest Mm -hmm. on their show too. And they asked me, you know, which of each, you know, be kind, be brave, be sober is their slogan. And they said, which of these kind of signifies where you are right now. And I said to them, well, I think my first year was about like being sober. And then my second year was helping people and being kind. And like, now I'm in this be brave phase where I'm taking risks. And it's like, it's this ongoing process that's like ever evolving. Yeah, I and mean that my I, I feel exactly the same actually. Mine mine was the the same. Be be sober, then be kind, and then be brave. And actually, you know, talking about the kindness thing, I I do find that one thing that people who've got sober have in common is is that I think they generally tend to be really empathetic yes. people because you know when you've been through that process, you realise that everybody is 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 struggling with something you know everybody is their lives may look sorted from the outside but yeah. everyone has something that they're having to deal with and when you realize that about people it does make you much more kind because um you know you you realize that if people are acting in a way that you don't like is there's probably something going on that you just don't understand it's so true yeah absolutely and so tell me about then after you published The Sober Diaries, you went on to write two other books, right? And one is already published, The Authenticity Project. And then you have another one coming up soon this year. Yeah, that's right. Um, so The Sober Diaries came out at the very end of 2017. So yeah, so how long ago now? Uh, is that three years or four? It's four years. So um, so it's been out for a long time. And, um, and when as soon as I finished writing that, I... I didn't want to stop writing because, you know, writing by this stage had become my therapy. It was, you know, it was, it was how it was my form of mindfulness in a way. And, and I really loved it. It was a real passion. And, um, but I didn't want to carry on writing about my own life because, because I was boring myself by then. I thought, you know, I just can't carry on writing about myself. And it, and my kids were older. My kids are teenagers now and they don't want their mum writing about, about them either. So, uh, so I thought, well, I'll, I'll try writing fiction. And so I did, I did a, I did a novel writing, a three month novel writing course, um, which was really uh, interesting, really helpful, and just gave me a lot, lot more confidence. And and then I published my first novel a couple of years ago. And in a way, it's it's not as different from nonfiction as I thought it would be because I still write as therapy. I still write about the things that matter to me. I still. So one of the main characters in the Authenticity Project is called Hazard, and he's an alcohol and cocaine addict. So his journey of sobriety is very much based on my own. Yeah. And there's a young mum called Alice who is addicted to social media, and I share, share a lot of that too. So, you know, so it allows me to explore things that I'm interested in, but one step removed from myself, if that makes yeah. sense. Absolutely. So, so yeah, so so that came out two years ago. And then this year, I've got my second novel coming out, which has different titles, depending on where in the world you're reading it. But if you're in the UK, it's called The People on Platform 5. And it comes out at the end of May. Wow. Oh, that's so incredible. I can't wait to read it. I actually have not read The Authenticity Project yet. Um, so maybe it'll be something that we put on our book club list for this year. And oh, that would be great. Well, it's, your it's, new book um, as well. Uh, you can get it on audio as well, if you prefer to listen to, to books. Actually, that's something I found really helpful in, uh, you know, when I was in the early days of going sober is if I was, you know, having really bad cravings, I would go out for a walk with an audio book and 
it sort of, you know, just getting away from the fridge and any yeah. drinking associations and having something playing in my head that wasn't my own thoughts. I found really helpful. Yes. So, so if you haven't discovered audiobooks yet, then uh, then I would definitely recommend that as a as a tool for your toolkit. It's so true. And when I was first in early sobriety, it was I was still living in the Middle East and I had long commutes, like half hour commute to work and then 20 minutes to the gym after work and I would, I could go through an audiobook in like a week. Um, and actually my whole audible, I think I might've even listened to the sober diaries on audible, but my whole audible is like all quit lit books. Um, and it's great <laughs> because you know, it's like you you're listening and you're like, wow, I'm not the, just like you said earlier, I'm not the only one going through this. And sometimes you can really resonate with different people's stories. Yeah. And podcasts, you know, do exactly yeah. That too. So, so yes, yeah, so I, I think those sorts of things are really helpful. Also, I I have this theory that people, that addicts, uh, are people who often have overactive brains. You know, yeah. so, so I think part of the reason we end up drinking too much is just to still all those yes. constant thoughts and constant sort of you know the constant whirring that goes on in your head. And you know, and I think audiobooks really help to do with with that as well. It just helps you sort of you know stop thinking. If you see what I mean. Yeah, it's so true. Definitely. I can totally relate to that. Monkey brain, they call it. Um, so yeah, so I think we we tend to have monkey brains. Yeah. <laughs> so tell me about like, so you have your book coming up this year. What else, what other ways are you kind of in the world of sobriety these days? That whole world has changed so much in the last seven years. So, you know, just to thinking back to then, there was, uh, you know, there was the blogging, the sober blogging world that I was part of, but it was all very undercover and very yeah. anonymous and very sort of, you know, you had to, you had to seek it out. And, you know, and there were just a few people like me around the world, um, blogging often under pseudonyms like mine. And, um, and it was, it was, you know, you had, as I said, you had to search it out. Yeah. Whereas now, it's much more public. So, you know, look at Instagram. I mean, Instagram yeah. is, there's a huge sober community on Instagram. And these people aren't, you know, they're not um, anonymous. You know, they're, on the whole, people are using their real names. They're using their real faces. Yeah. You, know, they're, you know, their sober community is out and proud in a way that it really wasn't seven years yeah. ago. So, um, so I'm sort of, you know, very active on on the you know the Instagram front I also have a page on Facebook called Sober Mummy which uh, I post on sort of two or three times a week just stuff that I see in the press that I find interesting yeah. um, and I get I get emails and, and messages from from you know hundreds of them from people every week and I try and reply to as much as I can so if you have messaged me and I haven't replied then I'm really sorry I, I do the best I can but I do get a bit overwhelmed but it does you know, all of that just, even after seven years, I think you, you know, the, the 12th step of AA is giving back. And, and there's a reason for that. And, and the reason is that not only is it good to help people, you know, who are at the beginning of the journey that you're further along the line um, on, but also it just hel it helps you too. You yeah. know, there are selfish reasons for doing it. It helps to remind you how far you've come and it yeah. helps to remind you not to go back there and and I think if you become totally disassociated from the sober community it's very easy to start thinking you know that little voice that never completely goes away that yes. says oh actually it's been so long now that I'm sure you can just have a glass of champagne with Christmas lunch yeah. you know that's not gonna that's not gonna be a problem after seven years you know I had that thought on Christmas day but um luckily I'm sort of connected enough yeah. to you know all the sober folks around the world that I know that that is you know that is the beginning of a very slippery slope and I'm not going to do it and there's just no point but uh, but you need to stay connected in order to be able to fight off those random thoughts when they do hit you I think it's so true and this is actually something that I struggled with a bit in the past few months so I just hit a thousand days 
uh, a week ago. Yeah. In the late fall, I sort of, I've stepped back a little bit from, I personally running a lot of the sober programs. So I've trained a lot of yoga teachers and coaches and they're doing that. And I was kind of moving in towards more like business coaching in, um, you know, October, November, December. And I also really, really struggled with, you know, wanting to drink again. And it was kind of this epiphany I had around my thousand days that was like, you know, I really need to get back into this. I can't step away from it. And so I'm actually leading personally leading the the newest sober yoga challenge that we're doing, like with a bunch of people that are, I think they're just around day 11 or whatever day it is now, day 13 of January. (laughs) Um, But I'm finding staying really close to it is really, really helping me because you're right. If you, the further away you get from it, what I said was the further away I get, the closer I must stay, was yeah, like what I wrote on my post. It's really, our memories are really funny things. You know, I, yeah. I could have written the Sober Diaries if I hadn't had the blog to base it on. Um, because when you look back, even just looking back two years, you know, your your memory, I guess it's a self-protection mechanism. You know, your memory filters out often a lot of the worst things. And and it's very easy to look back on life and with this sort of rose-tinted sort of glow and you forget how bad things were. I I think staying connected with people, you know, as you say, who are in very early sobriety just reminds you what it felt like. And it reminds you that you just don't want to go back there again. So so yeah, so it's really helpful. It's not just totally, it's not just selfless. It's there's also a really selfish reason for doing it. It's so true. Yeah. And I love what you said a bit earlier about, we were talking about um, kind of getting into the sober world and how public Instagram is these days with so many people being so um, open about their sober journey. And, and that was a big thing too, for me is I got really into writing, but it was within, you know, private sober Facebook groups for the very early days of my sobriety. And then once you discover the sober Instagram world, it just gave me so much confidence to finally start sharing about it. And um we're really, really lucky to have such a rich, sober Instagram community as well of like people to connect with around the world going through similar experiences. Yeah. And I think what that does is it sort of changes the narrative because, you know, what going sober used to be about is people used to think that you only quit drinking if you really had to, you know, you only quit drinking if you had a real problem and you'd reach rock bottom and your life was a complete disaster. And you know, that's not the case for a lot of us. You know, I think, I mean, I was very much a gray area drinker. You know, I I was neither a a normal drinker, I use them in quotes, or a sort of rock bottom drinker. You know, I was on a slippery slope towards rock bottom, but I was still quite a long way away from it. And I I think now what people are starting to realise is that you can quit drinking for you know, wholly positive reasons, because you, you know, the question shouldn't be, am I an alcoholic? And do I have to quit drinking? The question should be, is alcohol messing up my life? And would I be happier and healthier without it? And, you know, I think now what you see on Instagram is more and more people choosing to quit alcohol because they want to, and not because they have to. And I think that's a very big difference I mean it sounds it sounds like semantics but it's really not it's about a positive lifestyle choice and not you know something that is miserable and something that you're forced to do because you know you're sent off to a 21 day rehab it's about you know it's it's about choosing to live your life in a much better way yeah so true well I'm going to ask you one more question so I'm just wondering if you had any advice or wisdom for someone who's beginning an alcohol-free journey what advice would you give oh it's difficult to know where to start with that one Uh, but I I guess the first thing I would say is don't feel alone uh, because you really are not alone and um, and find a community there are and there is so much choice now of different communities that you can find. Everyone can find somewhere that they feel comfortable. So whether that's Instagram or a face private Facebook group or an AA meeting or whatever it is that you are most comfortable with, um, because they say that the opposite of addiction is connection. And, and I think that is so true. Um, so, so I would do that. And also just write it down, write down how you're feeling right now and why you want to quit. And 
those words you'll find you can come back to over and over again for years and just remind yourself how far you've come and why you're doing what you're doing. And and just finally, I would just say, be excited and be proud of yourself. It's a great decision to make and you should give yourself a huge pat on the back because you're doing something really amazing. Yeah, that's so true. Oh, Claire, this was amazing. And I really, really appreciate you coming on the show. I actually think you're the first quitlet author that I'm a fan of that I've read their book to meet in real life. And so it's really, really exciting. So I really appreciate the time you've took. And I'm sure that the audience is going to really resonate with your story. So thank you so much for sharing. Oh, it's a pleasure. I've, I've loved chatting to you. And thank you so much for, for, for your time. I've really enjoyed it. Oh, thank you, Claire. And I'm going to put in the show notes links to your books and everything. So if anyone is looking to find you, they can find you there. Brilliant. Thanks, All Amelia. Right, thank you. And have, have a great day. Your quarantine and yeah, stay in touch. I'm dying to see pictures of the new place in Bali. <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. Take oh, care. Bye. <laughs>